to this, the fourth legislative forum sponsored by the Mainstream Coalition. My name is Mark Weeby. I am a fairly recent board member. I've been serving on the Mainstream Coalition board for about a year and a half, and I am proud to call Mainstream my political home. Now, hey, all right, there we go. And I hope. I hope everyone in this room is proud to call Mainstream their political home. We won't ask for a show of hands of who's members, but if you want to join, there's lots of information on your seats. You've, you've probably seen it. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to call Mainstream your political home? Well, to me, it means the Mainstream is looking out for my decidedly very moderate uh, political interests. It means it's preserving a rational voice in these irrational times and keeping me informed, and this is really important, keeping me informed about what's going on in Topeka. That's what events like this are about today. Um, and we'd like to say this, if you aren't a member, it can do all this for you too. If you are, that's what we're doing. So join us, get involved, and it's only through your activity that we can make a difference. Um, before we get going here, I want to acknowledge uh, the uh, Colonial Church for sponsoring, or excuse me, for hosting this event. They've been a wonderful host for uh, many of these events over the last few years, and so it's really great to have this space to have these forums. So thank you to the Colonial Church. When someone told me that we have... Uh, a lot of, or maybe more than usual, more people from Wyandotte County here than usual, and I, I want to acknowledge that. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming all the way down into the, uh, not quite the heart of Johnson County, it's northeast of Johnson County, what I like to call South Wyandotte. So, um, I also want to acknowledge. Uh, some elected officials that we know are here, there may be others, so I apologize if I didn't see you, but we have, if you could stand when I call you Representative Boyer. All right, there you go. Thank you. Representative Clayton. And from the Shawnee Mission School Board, Donna Bisfield. Is that how you Thank you. Um, any other elected officials here that we could acknowledge besides our panel? I'm sorry, you're pointing to one, Pat, right? Al Frisbee. Al Frisbee, thank you. Very interesting. Very interesting. Right, um, well, I'm going to get on with the show. We'd like to keep things running and on time. Uh, tonight we have a panel of legislators who will be here to give us kind of a legislative update, uh, a little scorecard, what's been going on in Topeka over the last couple of months. And to moderate tonight, we have Janice McMillan. Janice, since you're going to be standing here soon, you might as well. Janice is a uh, former chair of the Mainstream Coalition. She is currently she currently serves on the uh, Mainstream PAC board, and I am especially grateful to her because she brought me onto the board. And one other thing that probably none of you in the room care about, but we also share the same uh, uh, university. She went to Trinity University. I did too in San Antonio, Texas. So I. We have a little connection. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to hand it over to Janice, and thanks again for being here. Thanks, Mark. And uh, I'd also like to welcome all of you for coming tonight. Um, we are, uh, or I would also like to thank uh, two of our mainstream coalition board members, Debbie Hasser and uh, Kathy Brydenthal. They did the yeoman's work in getting. Uh, speakers lined up and getting this organized uh, tonight, so uh, thanks for that. <laughs> well, the legislative session in Topeka is almost over. And, uh, <laughs> but I would remind all of you that this is the first year of a two-year biennium, so legislation that was uh, put forward this year is what we call alive yet um, until through next year. Uh, so we, some of the things that may not have uh, slipped through this year are probably in the wings waiting for next year. Um, I'm, uh, there's a lot to talk about and uh, there's a lot of work yet to be done, but what I'm not sure about is how much there is to celebrate uh, about uh, this year, but we have uh, three excellent 
legislators who are going to tell us more about that. Um, and I'm going to just briefly introduce them, uh, and I think you will note, uh, as I give a very brief descriptive of their background, that we have a very diverse uh, group of three, if you can be real diverse with three people, but they have very, very differing backgrounds, and so I think that's going to lend to some unique uh, insights and perspectives in their presentations tonight. So starting on your left is uh, State Representative Paul Davis, who is from Lawrence. Uh, Paul is serving in his sixth term in the state legislature and uh, his third term as the minority leader in the uh, Kansas House. Um, his district includes uh, a large portion of Lawrence, as well as a couple of townships outside of the city. And when he is not legislating, uh, Paul practices law in Lawrence. Sitting next to Paul is State Representative <coughs> Melissa Rooker, who is from Fairway, and Melissa is in her first year in the legislature. Her district includes all of Fairway, Roland Park, Westwood, and Westwood Hills, and parts of Mission, Mission Hills, and Prairie Village. Mel Melissa is uh, retired from the film industry. And our third legislator tonight is Senator Pat Petty, uh, who is from Kansas City, Kansas, and represents a part of Kansas City, Kansas, Edwardsville, and small portions of North Overland Park and North Merriam. Pat previously served in the Kansas House of Representatives. Then she was on the Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas Unified uh, uh, Government Board. And in 2012, she was elected to serve in the Kansas Senate. Pat spent her career prior to the legislator, le legislature as an educator. <coughs> Uh, each of the legislators will offer a short seven to eight minute summary of uh, what they see as the highlights and possibly the lowlights of this <laughs> session as it currently stands, given that we still have a budget and tax, uh, uh, tax uh, package to uh, uh, complete. And then we will open up, up for questions. We're going to do the questions a little differently tonight. This is an experiment. And if you behave, we'll continue. <laughs> if you don't behave, we're going to hand you those cards again. So what we're going to try tonight is to allow uh, participants, uh, the audience members, to uh, directly ask their questions. And we'll try to call on you in some reasonable order as, uh, as you're raising your hand. But I can't promise it will always be um, uh, exactly right. Um, and uh, so when, when the presentations have been given, then we will open it up for questions and we'll see uh, how it goes. And uh, so we will start uh, with uh, Representative Davis, please. I'm gonna mess everything up and uh, pull the mic off the stand here so I don't have to crouch uh, for the next seven minutes. But thank you so much for uh, having me and it is wonderful to see a, a great crowd here. Uh, Main Street Coalition uh, has been a tremendous influence, uh, not only in this community, but uh, in a lot of different parts of the state. And uh, you have been a voice for moderation and reason uh, that, frankly, is uh, needed as much today as it ever has been. I want to talk a little bit about schools, uh, because uh, whenever I come to Johnson County, I'm reminded of uh, what a great school system uh, that you have here in Johnson County and the fact that uh, we have outstanding schools all across the state of Kansas. Uh, yesterday I was in Salina and had an opportunity to uh, tour uh, a brand new school uh, that has some very exciting things going on. <coughs> Unfortunately, the Salina School District uh, doesn't have enough money to provide all day kindergarten. And it's something that they badly want to do and they need to do. Uh, when I originally was elected to the House of Representatives uh, in 2003, I came in with a wave of pro-public education legislators. Uh, we were all upset about the fact that the legislature was not paying a great deal of attention to public school funding. Uh, there was a court case that was starting to work its way up through the system, and a group of freshmen, Democrats, and Republicans got together and we decided to offer our own budget. And it was, the premise behind that was we wanted to put 
more dollars into our public schools. Unfortunately, we were not successful that year, uh, but we laid the foundation for what happened after the school finance case was decided in 2005. I see uh, one of my colleagues who came in with me, Carrie Huntington, um, who was part of that, that group. Unfortunately, since that time, a lot of those pro-public education legislators have been replaced by anti-public education zealots. And slowly over the years, we have seen this anti-public education sentiment uh, start to rise throughout the legislature. And it has really culminated this year. I have heard more attacks on school teachers, on public schools, on our education system than I ever have in the 11 years that I've been there before. And it is very, very disturbing. Uh, we were fortunately able to defeat a terrible, terrible vouchers bill this year. And we were fortunately able to defeat an effort to undo the Common Core standards uh, that are very important to the future curriculum of our, of our public schools. And we can talk about curriculum issues and voucher issues and things like that, uh, and, and I'm not convinced that the success of, of all public schools is due to funding, but what we do know is, is that places like Salina and other parts of the state that want to offer all day kindergarten, want to be able to attract competitive teachers, want to make sure that their class sizes are small, rely upon support from the state of Kansas in order to be able to do that. And last year, there was an event that occurred that is, in my mind, the most reckless thing that I have seen in my time in the Kansas legislature. House Bill 2117 is probably a number that's not known by all of you, but it's a number that people inside the Capitol know very well because it was the reckless income tax cut that was ushered through the legislature by Governor Brownback and signed into law by Governor Brownback. And as a result of that, we are now facing budget deficits. Budget deficits this year, budget deficits next year, budget deficits as far down the road as you can see. Because the state is now bleeding about $800 million a year out of a $6 million state general fund budget. Now, I'll be the first one to tell you last year that we had an opportunity to cut taxes. And I think what we should have cut taxes. But we had an opportunity to put money into our public schools. And the majority of the legislature and the governor said, no, our priority is income taxes. And as a result, our public schools are going to suffer, and they already have been. Uh, we will have a permanent budget crisis that will not allow us to put more dollars into schools. We're going to have a school finance case that will be ruled on by the Kansas Supreme Court sometime, perhaps later this year or next year. And I wish I could tell you where the money is going to come from in order to meet our constitutional obligation that we said we were going to meet several years ago that we have not met but for this income tax cut. Everybody loves to have a few more dollars in their pockets and many of us in this room are going to have a few more dollars in their pockets. But at what cost? At what cost? Uh, I, like probably most of you, uh, am a product of Kansas public schools. I got a great education here and our state is the great state that it is because the foundation has been laid by an outstanding public school system. And we have got to be able to continue to attract teachers into this profession. We've got to continue to attract people to come to live in Kansas because of the great schools that we have. And we are on the brink of really letting that slide down a very, very slippery slope right now. Um, so. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, you know, hearing your questions tonight, uh, but I wanted to come here tonight and really sound an alarm 
about our public school systems, and many of you know this already, uh, but uh, it is going to be very critical uh, when we get to the next election uh, that we try to bring more pro-public education people to the state capitol uh, because I am very, very afraid that if we continue down the road that we're, that we're going down, uh, Kansas is not going to look like the place that it is right now 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. So I very much look forward to your questions and, and thank you very much for the invitation to be with you. Thank you very much for inviting me to be here tonight. Just to tell you a little bit more about myself, I grew up in Fairway. I'm a product of the Shawnee Mission Schools, went on and graduated from KU. My husband grew up in Leewood, followed a similar path, and we married after graduating from college and spent 18 years living and working in Los Angeles. It was quality of life, it was the quality of our schools that brought us back here to Fairway to raise our kids. Um, as was mentioned, I retired in 2001 to be home with them, raise them myself, but I moved back here with my family in 2004 to raise them right. To me, this is a very personal thing. I, I began to get involved through the PTA with, with my kids' schools, and um, that work led me to, to become a volunteer advocate on behalf of the Shawnee Mission PTA and eventually Kansas PTA. And it was that work that led to, to my run for office last summer. Um, I, I was in the eye of the education storm. My, my committee assignments this year are a committee called Children and Seniors, a committee called Vision 2020, and the Education Committee for the House. And um, I think Representative Davis summed it up pretty well. We, we had an onslaught of education legislation proposed that would have privatized, voucherized, <coughs> and charterized our school system in the state of Kansas. And what we were able to do, it, 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 at times it doesn't feel like much of an accomplishment to be able to say that didn't happen, but in <coughs> this term, that, that was a pretty big deal, the, the kinds of legislation that we were able to stop. Um, <laughs> protecting the status quo of picking winners and losers by prioritizing the, the current system, putting bricks and mortar above the interests of our kids. Uh, I, was, I was accused of not caring about the education of our children. This was all couched in terms of parental choice. That is the, the, the code for wanting to be able to divert state tax money into private schools, home schools, religious schools, and the like. Um, it, was, it was a really tough session, and, and as was mentioned, this legislation has not been put to rest. It, it's merely been delayed. It will be back. Um, I'm not even sure it won't be back. I, I don't know. I don't have the, the experience to know if there are still legislative maneuvers that could happen. I could see things attached, but I know for sure next year it will be back. Um, it, it was something else. To, to listen to the testimony, to, to, to the, the, the cognitive dissonance that I felt so many times when the rationale for, for one bill was then the, the opposite of the reason the other bill was proposed. And, and that's where I really struggled and, and had some conflicts with um, some of the, the proponents of this legislation. I'm, I, I really think that we need to be consistent. So if we believe that, that providing a tax deduction for a medical procedure that we don't like is tantamount to the government funding that procedure with, with taxpayer dollars, then why is it not the same when we're talking about diverting tax dollars through corporate tax credits to religious and, and home schools and that sort of thing. So we need that sort of that, that's what that, that amounts to, but, but they don't see it that way. Um, so I took some votes this year, I took some stands this year that, that some have called very bright. I've been described in social media as tiny but fierce. Thank you, that uh, kind of summed it up. But, uh, it, it was, 
it was a difficult session. Um, we, we had the fight against Common Core revolves around the, the Glenn Beck scenario, that this is a, a government takeover, that they will be controlling the minds of our, our children through um, biometric testing and, and using the Skinner method to control their behavior. <laughs> You're laughing. This was the testimony provided. Um, it had nothing to do with the educational quality of, of the standards themselves. It had nothing to do with whether it's the right thing to create a consistent set of expectations for our children so that kids like mine who were moved midstream from California to Kansas. I had an incoming fourth grader and an incoming seventh grader. And I can tell you California and Kansas standards at the time were not in alignment. What does that mean? It means my fourth grader kind of missed learning long division. And we had to, we had to kind of tutor him and bring him up to speed. Think of our military families. Think of all the, the people we were <coughs> seeking to transfer their, their jobs to this state and move their families here. This is about our kids, but they don't see it that way. They, they think it's it, that there will be 563 different data points collected every time our kids sit down at a computer. And there's <laughs> this complete irrational fear. What finally turned that debate was when we had a day of testimony that involved educators providing rational, fact-based information. And I, I had sought some input from Shawnee Mission, and they provided samples of the math curriculum for second grade and the English curriculum for seventh grade. And it was an aha moment as members of the committee thumbed through this handout and realized that the bill which outlawed the teaching of anything that is contained in the Common Core standards, when you look at the second grade math standards and see that it involves teaching second graders to count to 100, that, there literally was a realization that, that you would outlaw the, the teaching of, of that kind of concept to our kids. So we were able to defeat that bill in committee. Um, <coughs> There were a couple, there was a, a charter bill for, it, it was a scholar, the charter school bill was defeated in committee and the special needs scholarship bill was defeated in committee. And both would have been incredibly damaging. I think the thing that struck me is that we were taken as a committee on a field trip. It was a 16 hour bus tour to look at a charter school in Newton, Kansas called the Walton Rural Life Center. And then we were taken out of state to see, this was my favorite, we had to go to Oklahoma City to see an example of a stellar career in tech ed center. And it couldn't seem to, to break through that, that those schools exist here in the state of Kansas. Um, and I, I smiled because it was, a, it was a fabulous place, but it's, a, in Oklahoma they, they combine resources from multiple school districts to create these centers of education. They're funded with 80% of their funding coming from local property taxes. It's a completely different structure than what we have here in Kansas. But what I realized by going on this field trip is that everything they're proposing that, that we change through legislation are things that we can already do in the state of Kansas. The Walton Center is a fabulous example of a charter school. It exists under current Kansas charter law. We have career and tech ed. We, we, what, my point in committee consistently was our schools are in survival mode and they cannot become more innovative and modernized without proper funding. And so that's the, the, the war we're waging. And make no mistake, it is a war. And it, it will continue. We need your help. We need you to stay engaged and, and continue to, to attend things like this and then go home and talk to friends and share the word because the more people know about what's happening, the, the, it, it gets down to providing reinforcements. We have, we have we're, we're really close to having the numbers we need of good, rational people. We've, we've come close to stopping 
a little more than, than what we have. Um, a number of near victories, and we just we need reinforcements. So that involves being active, engaged, informed voters. Thank you. Well, there's little for me to say, uh, but I'm Pat Petty, I'm in the Kansas Senate, and um, actually um, there is hope in the House, whereas in the past you might have heard, oh, the Senate will take care of it. That is totally reversed now. The Senate will take care of nothing. Um, there are eight Democrats, and there are a few survival mode moderate Republicans. And with that being said, uh, if a piece of legislation comes to the Senate floor and that it's been blessed by the governor, it will pass. And it has passed. Um, uh, and so um, that's where, where, as Paul was saying, the group he came in with, well, the group I came in with, they have their own agenda and they want to impose it on you. And, uh, for example, one of them uh, is the proponent of the Kansas Public Charter School. And as Melissa said, it is, I believe, as a 36-year educator in the state of Kansas, that it's the most onerous piece of, of legislation against public education uh, that, that I'm aware of and that, as I saw when I was in the House, are now in, in the Senate, and, and the impact would have. But at the same time, when we were uh, working this bill in Senate Ed, we did defeat it in Senate Ed. When we were working this bill in Senate Ed, and the question was asked, what about the cost? It was like, oh, you know, that's no big deal. We'll just have to pass uh, enabling legislation. Well, where's that money going to come from? You know, it's, ooh, you know, it's like, it's, 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 like it's in the cloud up here. Uh, we'll, we'll pull it out there. Uh, it's so, uh, but that's, that will be back. And I'd have to defer to Paul to say, will it be back in the veto session? I hope not. But the senator, Senator Melcher, uh, maybe your senator, um, Senator Melcher asked in committee of two people, two uh, senators in committee, if he could do anything to that piece of legislation to get their vote, so that he could pass it out of committee. And I hate to say, but I, I'm afraid that if it had gone to the Senate floor, it probably would have passed. Um, so I am very worried and concerned about that piece of legislation. And uh, what Melissa was kind and didn't, uh, whereas she was in House Ed, I was in Senate Ed, um, she was subjected to, I don't know how many hours her education committee met, they would meet morning, noon, and night. Uh, my committee met for a designated period of time, and uh, so uh, we did not meet as much as they did. But we passed out a lot of unnecessary legislation, and probably the one thing that I would say that that I would see repeatedly uh, with legislation in education was that we really don't care if we have degreed, licensed instructors. So, uh, so um, that was part of the Kansas Public Charter School Bill. They did not have to be licensed. It is part of the Innovative School Bill that passed. They, those uh, schools can decide if they want to, to opt out of having licensed teachers. And as a, you know, I, I think I just said I taught for 36 years, and I, um, and I was an active member of my teachers association. I, you know, I see it as a valuable tool and an important piece <laughs> of what we're saying, you know, what we talk about I went and got a list, and I think, uh, I didn't bring it with me, but I think there are like 41 uh, different um, jobs that we license in the state of Kansas, and we say that they all have to have a license, but yet we were, and so you can, you know, you can go to the dentist and you know that he had to be licensed, but, but yet you could send your children to school and you didn't know. <laughs> For sure. Although in a public school, I had to, I had my teaching certificate up on the wall, and I got a letter if I didn't, you know, if I actually wasn't certified in the area that I was teaching. Now I was certified in the area I was teaching, but but teachers did get that. 
Um, so we have one standard here that we say is important for our public schools, but we want to set up a different standard for what we will call the Kansas Public Charter Schools. This whole session has been, and I have a background in local government. I was with the unified government for 13 and a half years. So I'm very sensitive to um, local government and what local officials that you elect to represent you in both your city and counties and your school districts and what they, their responsibilities are. But I will tell you in Topeka, we are not. We believe that if we make a decision, we think that this is the right thing to do, it doesn't matter that your, your city council would say, hey, we think that this is the best thing for our community. It doesn't matter what the county says. It doesn't matter what school district says. It only matters what we decide in Topeka, that we should impose that right. But yet in Topeka, we really don't like the local, uh, like the federal government telling us. <laughs> so that is really a bad thing. So you know, we pass these resolutions to say to the federal government, "Don't tell us to do these kinds of stuff." But we turn around and then do just the opposite to our cities, and our counties, and school districts. Um, so this, for me, this was the year of local government uh, control and neglect. It was tax cuts for rich. It was altered education. It was, um, oh, guns, 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 weapons for everyone. And I, I will tell you that, and that again is a piece of, of taking away local control because uh, House Bill 2052, um, it does allow for concealed carry to be in every public building, except for a little group. And actually, in the Senate, we passed it out that it was also for K-12. Um, the House did not. So in conference, um, and I had offered an amendment on that Senate floor, which failed, but, um, but I knew that our conference conferees were uh, sensitive to the K-12. So in conference, we stuck with uh, the House proposal, so K-12 is not included. Um, but um, at your community centers and at your city halls and you name it, that at, in those not only can you carry, get licensed, and not only can you carry if you have a concealed carry license, but all the employees can too. Um, so the street workers, the you know the meter readers, they can all they'll all be able to carry. Um, so, but but many legislators think that that's the right thing to do. And as uh, Senator Knox, who was the big proponent of guns in the Senate, said to me after the bill passed in the Senate, he said, "Well, you know." In four years, this is just going to be a no-brainer. It's not going to be a problem. Nobody will really care. Um, it's, it's just the way of life. Uh, I'm trying to picture with K-12, I'm trying to picture, because I taught preschool my last 10 years. I was a teacher in the Turner School District. And I'm thinking about those four-year-olds having to walk through that metal detector every day as they come to school, and as they go to lunch, and as they go to recess. And, um, and I'm trying to think about how good they'll feel about that when they have to walk through, or you as their parents will feel about that if they have to walk through a metal detector every day. And somehow it just didn't seem to, to, to feel very good for me and make me feel any safer. Um, we also spend a lot of time fixing things that's not broken. I, 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 I'm sad, I must say, I repeatedly would say, what in the world does this legislation do and why do we need it? I, I served, um, I sat on the judiciary and transportation and education. And um, uh, I probably talked too much on the Senate floor, but when you're one of eight, you, uh, and there's a lot of legislation that you just, you know, you try not to get a bark bag, um, <laughs> you have to figure out what you're going to do to at least cause your colleagues there to maybe stop and think. Um, 
we were we did we were successful when it came to the uh, a wonderful piece of of, edu of legislation called Read for Success. And that's, you know, that's a governor's initiative. He hasn't signed this bill yet, um, but it was his initiative because he believed that third grade, that every child at the end of third grade should be able to read. And I agree with him, uh, but, but he thought that the, as part of that bill, that if you couldn't, then you should be retained. And also, you should be retained, but as a parent, you don't get to say no. So that was an original piece of legislation. Not only should they be retained, but the parent had no control at all, no say. So we took away every piece of it. We took away parental control, and in, in, in my committee in Senate Ed, you know, nobody wanted to talk about what kind of impact this had on the child's self-esteem. Um, and, and the whole thing about, isn't third grade a little late? <laughs> Yes, it is. Um, so uh, we tried a number of things to, well actually we did improve the bill in Senate Ed before it was passed out and it did have a parent, uh, the parents then had a piece to, uh, a control over it and it also, it also um, uh, uh, kind of moderated it and because it then did not affect every school district. If your school district was already performing at the average of the state, then you wouldn't even be impacted by it. And um, so that's how it came out of Senate Ed. And then on the Senate floor, we were actually able to change it to first grade. So uh, a lot of people are debating whether, you know, how is the governor going to sign it or not? We'll see. But it now impacts first grade and, and not third grade. Still a bad bill, you know. I mean, it, I mean, really, you know, you don't need. Teachers know what to do, and, and parents don't know what to, and they need to talk to the kids. But if you're gonna, we all, when I started, I mean, when I started teaching early on, we used to talk about the gift of time. And so parents could make a decision whether they wanted to send their child to kindergarten, you know, they might wanna wait because they might not be ready. So um, that that's kind of a, a, a term that people have forgotten about. Maybe they need to grow a little bit. Anyway, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I will, I will end with saying, since I represent Wyandotte County, a lot of Wyandotte County, and a small portion of Johnson County, I have had uh, several people say to me, oh, isn't that a really different group? <laughs> and it's like, well, let's see. They all want fair taxes, they all want good schools, and they all want safe community. No, I think there's a lot of <laughs> Okay, we're going to open this up for questions now, and um, I'm going to, um, Harry's going Harry's gonna to try to uh, keep track of, of uh, how you uh, uh, raise your hands, and we'll do the best we can. I'm going to ask you, please, just ask a question. Do not try to uh, express your concerns or your views first. You, you can talk to them later uh, after this is over and say that, but so we can get through as many subjects as we can tonight. Uh, we're going to really try to hold you to that or we'll whip out those cars. <laughs> so, so uh, Floyd? Yes, I, I'd like to know, can you explain what taxes have been cut and, and kind of get on to the sub-chapter as I don't quite understand and I've read as much as I can about it. <clears throat> Well, the taxes that have been cut are income taxes. So we now have only two income tax brackets. Uh, what's kind of interesting is, is that if you're a single person and you make about $35,000, you are paying the same tax rate as, for instance, uh, Charles Koch, uh, who makes a few dollars more than uh, $35,000. The, the part of this that bothers me the most is, is really the business entity part of it because what we have now done is exempt profits for all business entities, except for C corporations, from any income tax whatsoever. And you may have seen uh, some, an article in the paper recently where a gentleman from the Tax Foundation, which by the way is a fairly conservative organization, said that we have the worst tax plan in the country. And one of the reasons why is this business part that he described as essentially just ripe for mischief. 
uh, and really is not going to have the effect of stimulating the economy. And uh, why it's ripe for mischief is, is if you own a business, and I know a little bit about this myself because I'm one of those people, and um, it allows you to change how you classify income from wage income that is subject to income tax to profits, which is not subject to income tax. So the owners of a business, uh, a percentage, and oftentimes a sizable percentage of their income, they will not pay income tax on. But all the people that work at that business, the secretaries, the file clerks, they are going to pay income tax on every penny of their income. So I like to call it, this is the uh, workers pay, bosses don't yeah. tax law. Um, yeah, I'd like a little bit of a clarification. When you talked about their saying that you don't need a degree to teach um, you know, throughout the um, years and stuff, I have known of some business people who want to take early retirement and then go and teach like math in the high schools and stuff. They're degreed and stuff, but it's not a per se teaching degree. Um, and there are other business professionals also who want to take an early retirement and give back to the community and teach. So I would like a, a clarification on the um, degree bit. Well, um, interestingly enough on the Kansas public charter schools, it doesn't speak specifically to whether you have to be degreed in anything. Um, so you could, that could be a category, uh, but um, actually it leaves the schools free to determine who they want to have teaching there. Um, so what, what, what you're talking about, and um, uh, which has been, I, I worked on repeatedly, uh, is to have people be able to come back and, and then work towards being li a, a licensed educator. Um, that could be a part of it, but it actually is a very broad and doesn't necessarily mean that you would have to be degreed. And I'll, I'll just add to that. That's actually one of the reasons that we made the choice to move from California. Our kids started in public school out there. We lived in Los Angeles. We made the move to private school eventually because of issues are... Our elementary school was built to accommodate 600 students and it had 1,200 the year my daughter was in kindergarten. Her kindergarten teacher was a 22-year-old <coughs> college graduate. She had a business degree. She was put into a kindergarten classroom with 33 five-year-olds. She was not equipped to teach because she had no life experience she admitted she didn't have younger siblings, she had not babysat, she had no clue what a five-year-old mind, how that works, how long it takes them to use the restroom. The fact is that my daughter, we were called to a special conference because this teacher decided her motor skills were not, not normal. And she was talking about, she was cutting upside down. We normally put her a thumb at the top. My daughter was doing it backwards. My husband came with me and he said, could you go get the scissors that you're using in the classroom? And she did, and he proceeded to demonstrate how very resourceful my left-handed daughter was for <laughs> figuring out how to make the scissors work. She had not recognized that. And this is the year these kids are learning to write. That's the trouble with having non-credentialed teachers. They aren't equipped. They may be bright, they may have, and at the high school level, I admit that there are certain disciplines where that may make a lot of sense. And those, those, those are the examples I know of, of people going to teach sure. high school and where we, you have a math class and you don't have anything else. There are ways to accommodate that. But what this package of legislation speaks it tries to do is lift the requirements for accredited teachers. It's rid of common sense at all levels. Yeah, and, and no, it makes sense that someone in those math can do math only. Uh, Kansas has some great universities. What are they doing to talk about this particular bill? Are they lobbying? Are they uh, involved at all? Well, I'm going to turn your question around a little bit, and I apologize for doing that. 
they're fighting for survival, quite frankly, because uh, they are trying to uh, fight against the, the budget cuts that are occurring because of this tax plan. Uh, right now, the House is proposing to cut 4% across the board from all higher education institutions. And actually, that 4% figure is a little misleading because uh, the number is actually higher because of a salary cap issue. I was told by the president of Pittsburgh State University that the effect of the cut on Pittsburgh State would be 13%. Um, I mean, that, that is a, a devastating uh, cut for those institutions. Uh, so, I mean, they're, they're really fighting to do that. But there are, there are education uh, professionals from the universities who do come up to the legislature quite uh, frequently and, and testify on issues. And uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, we don't have enough people that are listening to them. Who do you see, if anybody, on the Democratic side to challenge Brownback for governor? <laughs> All day. All day. <laughs> there will be a strong Democratic candidate for governor. Just stay tuned. <laughs> has to do with whether the if the Supreme Court decision comes back and, and requires the legislature to, to fund schools to the statutory level, where will that money come from? Where, where will the governor find it? And Senator Pat, Petty just reminded me that we have a bill that passed the House, the Senate wisely referred it back to committee, but that means it, it, it's still alive. This bill seeks to reclassify the um, local option budget, which is your local property taxes. 10% of it would be reclassified as local operating budget, and it would be laundered. That is the correct term. It would be moved from your local district. It would go through the state general fund and get returned to your district. So the defense of this by the proponents is that it doesn't change the bottom line. You know, the schools don't lose any money through this. But what it does is it changes the, the base aid number from its current 3838 per student, it becomes 4264 per student. So magically, without spending one extra dime, the state is very close to that statutory required number. Now, I voted against it in the House. I feel like the court anticipated this in the Gannon decision that they enjoined the legislature from any kind of legislative tricks like this. We're do, proposing to do it anyway. I think that will serve to enrage the court, not pass, not satisfy the court. So I think it's it's a very misguided maneuver. But that's one of their ideas is that that would actually work. They also scream bloody murder that. We, it's 12000 per student that the state is spending. Um, nobody ever wants to allow that CAPERS and capital outlay and bond in interest, that, that those payments matter. But we, ha we had another bill that was going to require 65% of the money that schools receive be spent in the classroom. That bill does not count some of those categories. So that, that's where that, that whole consistency thing doesn't work for me. If it's gonna, if we want to say, okay, fine, it's 12,000 per pupil, then we ought to count 100% of it as being spent on our classrooms because you have to build the buildings, you have to pay the, the teachers their salary and benefits, you have to pay the interest on the loans to do all that. It just doesn't, it really doesn't make sense. To clarify, would you tell the audience the difference between the 3838 and the 12,000? How those two? Well, this is the big myth. Would you repeat that? The the question is what what is the difference between the 3838 per pupil and the 12,000? And that's where our friends at Kansas Policy Institute have done a terrific job of spreading the, the notion that it's really 12,000 per pupil. It is those those different funding categories that all do fall under the line item of education, that, that they're all in that category, no doubt about it. But our schools are bound by the finance formula to spend the money in different categories. So 3838 is the base aid per pupil that makes the, the, the that is the operating 
money that the districts have to work with. That is the money that they receive that actually keeps the lights on, pays the salaries, and allows the schools to operate. The, these other categories have to be spent in these specific ways that they're allocated. And that, that's the, the heart of the, the discussion is that it doesn't, it doesn't help when you increase funding to some of those other categories, it still doesn't help us operate our schools. An example would be, um, to, uh, Representative Davis referred to Salina wanting to, to have all day kindergarten and some school districts, two of which I represent, Kansas City, Kansas and Turner, they made a decision that they would use their at-risk funding to fund all day kindergarten. So all the students in those two districts for the last, now this is going on the sixth year, have, go, do have all day kindergarten. Um, but that was a, but they took that money that could be used for at risk, and of course we're talking about two school districts that have, um, Kansas City, Kansas has free, uh, it have free students on free and reduced lunch in the 90% range, and the Turner School District has students on free and reduced lunch on the 76, around 76% range. So we're talking about high uh, need districts, and so that's, that's, a, that's a commitment that they've made and a decision that they've made. But, um, but they have to use that in those particular, that's a category that they could use that money in. Could you speak to the, the decisions that were made on reproductive health and for faith issues? I should probably hand the mic to Representative Bollier <laughs> because nobody can speak to this better than she can. And I would, uh, I would invite you to have a conversation with her after this is over, but, uh, uh, you know, there, I, I don't know of all of the, the intricacies of this 70-page bill that we, that we went through, but, uh, you know, the, what I got from, uh, a lot from Representative Bollier is, is that the, the legislature is getting into the realm of making medical findings. And, um, and, you know, one, we shouldn't be doing that. And number two, uh, according to Representative Boyer and, and others, we are making incorrect medical findings. And, um, you know, the, uh, I, I'm not, every year that I've been in the legislature, there has been, uh, you know, more and more abortion related legislation. And I think people are just, getting sick and tired of the legislature spending most of their time talking about this this issue and um, you know there's a lot of other important business that needs to be uh, discussed and we just spend far too much time on this I tried to follow uh, representative boys lead in, in the Senate it didn't work um, but I will say that I talked to a, a doctor from KU about what we passed and uh, said, hey, you know, this is, we've got this in there that, doc, that the doctor, if they are going to perform an abortion, they have to tell the woman that she has higher risk of breast cancer and more likely to have miscarriages. And she said, well, you know what we'll do? She said, we'll just hand out a piece of paper that says, this is what the government says. <laughs> <laughs> What's the one talking point? What's the one bullet point that, that if I can grab them by the scruff of their proverbial necks, what do I say to them? I get one shot at this. What do they need to hear from us as parents of first graders? We're going to be impacted this, and this for another 11 years. What do I say? Honestly, I don't know if you can break through with them. But what I encourage you to do is to remind them that the public schools exist to educate all children. That is the heart of choice for parents. That is the choice that everybody has. Um, there are other options available for people who so choose. And one of the, the pieces of the scholarship bill that we defeated on the House floor was this corporate tax credit scholarship um, program 
and, and they kept saying, it's for the children. It's for the children in need. It's, you know, for families that, that would otherwise not have choice because they can't afford it. Well, you know what? The day after we defeated that bill, the Shawnee Mission Education Foundation announced a scholarship fund to honor our outgoing superintendent that will pay for all day kindergarten scholarships because our district has to charge parents a fee to pay for that extra half day. So that choice exists. There are scholarship programs available, and that was one of the, the points that I used, the research I did in this district. I, I inquired at 10 different private schools that exist just in, in this area, and they all have scholarship funds. They all are nonprofit foundations that can accept donations and provide scholarships to kids in need. This is another example of something that already exists in the state. What we're really looking to do is give schools 70% or corporations a 70% dollar for dollar tax credit for the donation that they made. Um, you, need to, you need to talk to them about the fact that our schools are one of the biggest attractors that we have for, for, for economic interests. That is one of the, the key drivers for companies looking to relocate to this state. Um, you need to talk to them about the fact, the vision, and this was how the education committee was run. Our, our chairwoman shared the vision, and I use air quotes, because it involved a child-centric education. And I asked, if the six Johnson County superintendents came and spoke at a Johnson County caucus lunch, and I asked them what child-centric meant to them, and not one of them had an answer. They looked at me and said, everything we do is child-centric. So um, this is about defunding our public schools, and they won't admit that. They say it's for the children, and so, I don't know. I, I, I feel for you. <laughs> and the bill that the Kansas Public Charter School, I mean, of course, you know, again, we there's all these awful names. Read for Success, you know. Um, Family Protection Act. I mean, it just goes on. Um, but that bill, um, it originally had 100% tax credit, and, it, and then to, to make it a little bit more palatable, well, actually, I <laughs> think there was actually no way you could figure out what it was going to cost and what it was going to take away from the, not only cost, but also take away from coming into the state. So that changed, but it did set up the scenario, this is what I laid out, it set up the scenario that, and, and I will be honest, I'm a Catholic, and, and I went to parochial school. I, I went to public high school, I went to parochial school. My children went to parochial school. I paid tuition for them to go to parochial school. My, the school that my children did go to, they have, um, they, they have scholarships. In fact, almost every child that's there now is, has some sort of a reduced um, tuition. But if you just take, um, let's say take St. Anne's, and I, I think it costs about $7,000 a year to go there now. And so a parent, if, if St. Anne's became a public charter school, uh, then a parent, they can charge tuition, they'd be getting $5,400 per child from the state, but that parent could turn around and they could get a tax credit, they could then make a donation of $7,000, and they could get a tax credit for that $7,000. So, you know, it's it's just it, it's uh, it, it's a really, as Melissa said, it's it's taking away. It's saying we have this pot, but we we're, we're gonna you know we're gonna increase who's using this pot of money, and we don't know how we're gonna grow this pot of money because of course we can't fund it right now. Hmm. Uh, I don't know with Jeff Melcher. Um, he's a businessman. He thinks that he's at, at the same time he he, he was very support. Oh, he pushed making sure that all school districts have on their website a complete list of their budgets because you know it's so important to have this transparency so on the one hand you know he wants that kind of stuff on the other hand we want to have public charter schools that actually have no um 
and ac accountability except for they had to take the state assessment. So if you had a public charter school that was K to nothing, and, and, and I, they, have a, they would get a five-year contract with a, an automatic three-year uh, extension, and there was actually about no way you were going to get rid of them once they were there. I'm serious. I mean, I kept looking for how you, I asked questions repeatedly in committee. I mean, there was really, it was, unless they stole all the money. That was about it. I'm, I'm so curious about this, this, that what's going to happen. If you're in a break now, and the veto session's coming, and what do you think's going to happen? Or what's, the, what's scheduled to happen? I know you don't know what's going to happen. We'll let Paul talk about that. I'm just curious about what else we have to look forward to. A lot. <laughs> Uh, first thing I want to do actually is comment on the gentleman's question. I, I would tell him that I'm an education voter and I'm watching. Yeah. Uh, but the question is, is when, uh, when, when does the uh, session resume and uh, what are we doing now? And the veto session or wrap-up session starts on May 8th. There has been a uh, declaration that uh, the legislature is going to attempt to finish their business within 80 days, which is 10 days less than uh, the Constitution says that we're supposed to conclude our business during. Whether that happens or not, I'm not sure. That means we, we will have to get business done in five days. But there's still a budget yet to, to be passed, and there may have to be a tax plan that goes along with that budget because we have a rather sizable deficit that has to be closed. And uh, we'll, we'll have to see how that's going to happen. I'm curious in the state, where is the voice of the Chamber of Commerce? <laughs> <laughs> OK. Sorry. <laughs> I think everyone heard the question, where is the voice of the Chamber of Commerce? The Kansas Chamber is a wholly owned subsidiary of Coke Industries. Yeah. Yeah. The local chambers, you, you need to be careful. In this area, our local chambers are excellent. They're, they're wonderful resources for our communities that champion the quality of life and, and all the right issues. Um, so it depends on where you live, I guess. I would say that there are some people in the room I'd love to introduce you to after this forum wraps up. There, the efforts that we have been undertaking my, my tenure with the Kansas PTA and, and the group that's still with them continuing is to create that kind of talking point, easy to access information for parents around the state to use when they're speaking with legislators. And we're trying to encourage parents to organize and, and advocate for their public schools. Additionally, there's a, a grassroots organization called Game On for Kansas Schools that started at one elementary school in the heart of my district, um, it, it grew, it, it spread throughout the high school attendance area, it then went district-wide, and, and they've been successful linking up with Blue Valley and Olathe parents. They are, like I said, an ad hoc grassroots organization, and that's exactly the kind of information that they share, and we are, um, I know their effort is, is to spread and grow this movement statewide, they've linked up with some national groups, and I think that, uh, the, the unofficial head of it is here, and, and I will definitely connect you after the forum. Um, in your opinion, is the only way to prevent high school and colleges this session from passion to continue to have No. <laughs> um, I, as a freshman, I've had this unique uh, experience that, that we like to call freshman indoctrination. We had a rather intense series of meetings early on with the powers that be. The governor invited us to his office and, and leadership, it, all the different leadership um, people spent time with us trying to teach us how things work. And I was struck by the fact that each and every one of those meetings involved the, these folks that were veteran lawmakers who had been there last year explaining that they had nothing to do with this tax plan. This was not the plan they wanted. That it it just happened. And so <laughs> I as a freshman 
just my my wide-eyed in innocence was was to say, oh really? Well, what was it about the plan that you did like? And you know, the governor said, well, it kind of it, it was the same principles, but it just it was a slower glide to to the to reach those goals. It was spread out over a longer time frame. And I would follow that up every time. I asked why we couldn't revisit that. So this notion that it's an either or proposition, I think is, is false. We have options. We don't have to do this, this business of we must extend the sales tax in order to avoid cuts. Because let me tell you something. What they're asking is for us to vote to extend the sales tax so that they can reduce income taxes. And I have gone on record with the governor's office five separate times this session that that is a non-starter for me. I, I was not there when this tax was instituted. I am not bound by a promise that it would sunset in three years. But my vote is dependent on the idea that if we do vote to extend the sales tax, it would be while keeping the, the income ta taxes where they are so that we have some balance in our system. Representative Rooker made a great point right there. The governor is going to run around the state next week on his higher education tour and tell everyone that you have to hike the sales tax in order to avoid these cuts to universities. And that is not the truth. The, the sales tax is being, they are requesting to raise the sales tax to subsidize these income tax cuts that primarily benefit people on the, on the upper end of the income scale. Um, and we should not fix bad tax policy with more bad tax policy. Right now, there the first bill that the governor signed changed the judicial selection process for the Kansas Court of Appeals. Uh, that was able to happen because the judicial selection process for the Kansas Court of Appeals is not embedded in the state constitution. The judicial selection process for the Kansas Supreme Court, however, is embedded in the Constitution and requires a constitutional amendment requiring two-thirds vote of both the House and the Senate. Uh, the Senate has approved the governor's constitutional amendment. The House has not, and I don't believe that it will, fortunately. Um, I happen to think that we have maybe the best method of selecting judges in the country. It's not perfect, but it minimizes the amount of political influence and allows our courts to truly be an independent judiciary. And the governor is simply trying to inject more politics into selection of judges, which is going to, in turn, infuse more politics into judicial decisions. Although I'm deeply grateful to each of you, I'm very depressed. Um, what I would like to know is if there's any, what, if, I know we can't convince Jeff Melcher, I know we can't convince Governor Brown back, what can we do? If I write to my representative with whom I agree, that's okay. Does that help? Does she need? Yes. Do <laughs> <laughs> need if I write to people who are not my representative that don't agree with me? I'd like to know what would be the most effective, if any way, to reach that person. Well, I would say yes, because I can't tell you how many emails I've gotten about protect my gun rights, protect my Second Amendment. Um, and um, so, you know, and a lot, and, and, and a lot, I don't respond back to them if they're not my constituent. I do respond back to them if I was constituent. So that's a heavy lobby that's going on out there. So I would say, yes, you know, write to all of us. I mean, send emails, emails to all of us. But the best thing you could do is continue, if you belong to a book club or, you know, or a, 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 a church organization, you know, we should talk about politics. Um, bring up to people that they have a voice, and they and we need to hear that voice because we are hearing the voice of those people that support certain things, 
And that is a weapon that uh, legislators use. I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I've listened to it repeatedly in committee uh, of legislator of, of senators saying, well, you know, my, my citizens support this because look, they elected me, I'm here, and so uh, they support it. So that use, use every tool that you have available to contact your legislators and others about your opinion because <coughs> then we have that information to say, no, that's just not the only voice we're hearing from. You know, a lot, a lot of people get frustrated trying to uh, communicate with legislators who they don't think are listening, and I, I would urge you to keep communicating with those people, uh, if for no reason, to irritate them, because they deserve to be irritated. <laughs> but, but what you need to do is really not just is communicate with your legislators, and I think what may be perhaps even more important is, is communicating with your friends and the public and helping to educate them about what is going on. There are not enough people that are tuned in to what's going on, and we've got to help them get tuned in. And I'm going to put in one plug uh, for how you can do that. Uh, if you're not on Facebook, I would recommend you get on Facebook and come to my elected official site and like me, you don't even have to like me, but just hit the <laughs> like button, and you will start getting information every day uh, from us, and you can take that information and you can share that with all of the, your friends on Facebook. It is a great way to get people informed. We had a Facebook post two weeks ago we sent out that was viewed by 100,000 people. I mean, that's the power of how you can get information out these days. Let me, feedback. I'm sorry. That, that's okay. I just wanted to add, there's no right or wrong way to communicate with us. I've been at a couple forums in the last week where people have said, oh, I've heard you need to send a handwritten letter. I've heard no one pays attention to our emails. I'm here to tell you my secretary keeps track of phone calls for me on given all the various bills when, when we start getting that kind of communication. I look at every email. It's, it sometimes is a, a tough go to, to get them answered in a timely manner, but it is my intention to, and I'm working through that list through this break. But um, I don't care if it's a form letter email. I don't care, you know, it's always nice if you have the time to add a personal message. But I keep track by category, by bill number. I keep track of who's communicating with me. And like Senator Petty, I answer my own constituents as a, my first priority. Um, but keep writing. You need to let us know when you agree with us. You need to let us know when you don't, because that's that that's powerful stuff when when we hear from you. I hardly ever disagree with Melissa, but um, I would say if you're uh, when it comes to a form, you get some sort of a, a form of information. Try to personalize it some way. Try to change it a little bit. I mean, if I have five emails and they all are exactly the same, then I'm kind of like, oh, you just got this from the NRA and you're just passing it on to me. So, you know, and if you're going to, so, and, and, I, and, and having said that, you know, I've sent those, but I always try to change them a little bit. So take the time to just make some sort of change, then I actually feel more inclined to read it. You mentioned in your presentation a minute ago that public schools get 3838 for base. Why did you say 5700 when you're talking about charter? It's 54, I think. 5400, because that's what's been figured as the average amount. And so that was a, a when it came to what what kind of a figure are we talking about? So from uh, Del Dennis, that's what we got as a figure of 5400 that that on an average, um, a public charter school would get per across student the state of Kansas. across the state of Kansas. It, it would vary by district to district, but it, about that. Okay. I think what it, it involves the base number plus some of the, the local effort that the school would get. So that is the calculation. I don't care what they had the Board of Education fiasco with the Tesla design. And it took that to happen to get people motivated to go ahead and change the Kansas Board of Education. My fear, and what I'm asking you guys is, 
we have right now, the pendulum is really swinging this way right now. It's going to go so far, people are going to get upset and then get involved again. A, how much damage will be done by that time? <laughs> and B, with the Kansas Board of Education, we didn't have the code and the K, uh, the Kansas uh, Policy Institute to come through to give money. So it's a different time now. What's going to happen? If it, if it swings that way, is enough money going to come in to make it that stay that way? That's up to you guys. How susceptible are you going to be to those negative postcards that land in your mailbox? How much money are you going to donate to a candidate of your choice? How likely are you to get out to vote? And how many people are you going to talk to to make sure that they go out and vote with you? That's what it's going to take because we know these groups. We know the money they put into these campaigns. Um, I've made a series of votes that will earn me a primary without a doubt. Um, I was heckled our final night as I explained the vote that I made on the gun package. I voted no. And I dedicated that vote to the victims of the Sandy Hook tragedy. And as I read their names, I was heckled. And the, the, the Kansas Rifle Association was in the house. So for that vote alone, there's going to be major attention. The, the abortion lobby, there, these are single issue organizations that get very active and very nasty when it comes to election season. It's up to you guys to protect those of us that, that you do agree with. So how active are you willing to be? The question is, uh, what are the chances that we're gonna ex see expanded Medicaid in Kansas? And that's a very good question. Uh, our governor seems to be having a very hard time uh, making up his mind on, uh, I think, what should be a, a fairly easy decision. The, the decision that Chris Christie in New Jersey said yes to, Rick Scott in Florida said yes to, John Kasich in Ohio said yes to, and uh, we, can, we have the opportunity uh, for a small amount of money uh, to cover uh, over 225,000 Kansans and give those people an opportunity to get some health care that's going to keep them out of the emergency rooms, uh, not to mention the fact that if we don't say yes to this, uh, our hospitals are going to lose uh, millions upon millions of dollars uh, in a disproportionate share payments. So it, it should be an easy decision. I don't know where, where the governor is on this, uh, but we'll find out sometime. Can you tell us what's happened to the bill where the legislature's trying to meddle in local politics with regard to nonpartisan elections and November elections? Okay. City government. <laughs> so, as many of you may know, there, there's an effort to try to uh, change the date for local elections, city council, school board, and also to make those elections partisan. And uh, our Secretary of State, of course, is leading the effort. And uh, that bill uh, is, is still in committee. It is, there is the possibility that it could be acted upon in the wrap-up session. Uh, but you know, one thing you should know about that is there are a lot of active duty military people who serve on city councils and school boards. And if you make their those elections partisan, they will no longer be able to, to serve. Because if you're an active duty in the military, you cannot serve in a partisan political office. Not to mention the fact that the, the system works just fine. If it, it ain't broken, and we sure as heck don't need to, to fix it. There was a great line that one of our fellow legislators uh, gave that sort of the mantra of the Kansas legislature is, uh, uh, if it isn't broken, the legislature uh, will fix it and fix it and fix it until it is broken. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you guys being here. I know I think they deserve another round of applause. to have you guys here. I was lucky enough to work with Representative Davis and Petty, um, Senator Petty, she was Representative Petty when I worked with her years ago. 
Um, and I really, really appreciate you all three being here. Great information. And um, I am Joy Ginsburg. I'm on the Mainstream Coalition Board. I'm representing the membership committee tonight. And I, I'm so happy about the crowd tonight. And I hope, hope, hope that the information that we learned tonight doesn't stay within these four walls, because if it does, then it's, <laughs> it doesn't go as far as we need it to go. And um, we um, are celebrating our 20th year of Mainstream Coalition this year, which is incredible. We have been <laughs> fighting for rational issues for 20 years, started with um, evolution and parent school and vouchers and now the pendulum is keep. I think I keep setting me up in the back of the room a little bit. Is is swinging farther and farther and farther to the extreme, and we really, really need to join together to ensure that our elected officials are making decisions that make sense for the future of our state. Um, I am a seven-year-old who's in public education, and it is so important to me. And I know it's important to everybody here in this audience. The more members that we have within our organization, the more power we have. And really, um, it was said earlier, we want Mainstream Coalition to be your home. We want you to join. If you're not a member already, please, please, please take the time. There are membership forms on your chairs. Please, please, please join. A lot of you are already members, and we would always like an additional contribution <laughs> to fight this war against education and other things that were discussed tonight. So, um, you know, feel free. No contribution is too small or too large. So <laughs> there will be somebody at the back of the room collecting um, membership forms and information. Um, if you have friends, family members, neighbors, anybody that you think are interested in the issues that were discussed tonight, please, 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 um, by all means, take as many forms if, as you want. And... <laughs> Um, distribute them around your neighborhood and churches and um, to your friends. A couple quick announcements before we leave. Um, we always like to get together with like-minded individuals and there are a couple events coming up that I just want to let you know about. Um, one is a fundraiser on April 20th. There are um, flyers all over the room. It's a Zapata. Um, fundraiser and we would love for you to attend. There is also another forum that's being hosted by the League of Women Voters on Tuesday, April 23rd at 7 o'clock at Antioch Library. And um, it's going to be a great panel of um, former legislative research folks and the former director of um, the budget. Um, at the Kansas budget. So um, anyway, please, please, please try to attend. Love to fill the room like we have tonight. Again, at 7 o'clock, Tuesday, April 23rd. And um, we always like to, after these events, go across the street to the tavern, get a few glasses of wine, and discuss everything that happened here tonight um, among each other. So I'd love to invite you over there. And thank you very much for coming. Appreciate it.